Dolan. I'm the Communications and Membership Officer. We also have a few other agent staff here. We have Connor, we have Derval, we have Amy, we have Joan, and we have Juliana. Uh, so, so it's great to have you all here today. Uh, and uh, what I'll just do now is I will hand you over to uh, Derval for a few of the agent updates. Thanks, Derval. Thanks, Barry. Good afternoon, everyone. It's great to see you, and I hope to see a lot of you in person at the AGM next Wednesday. Um, it's in the Ashling Hotel, so please do come along. You can still register at the moment. And we're delighted to welcome Charlotte Byrne from the Irish Refugee Council with us today. And it's really heartening to see so many people coming together to support refugees in Ireland. It's a challenging time, and there's much to do to protect our new learners and to make sure that they feel safe and welcome. But we know that there's amazing work happening across the sector. And once again, adult education is leading the way in opening its doors and being inclusive. From a European perspective, I wanted to share some updates with you. I'm on the board of the European Association for the Education of Adults, the EAEA, just in case <laughs> you didn't know that acronym. And there's a lot happening across Europe to support refugees. Um, Oleg Smirnov, who is the director of the Ukrainian um, organization or the DVV office in Ukraine, is also an EAEA board member and he sent us some materials that he developed firsthand with colleagues um, to support Ukrainian refugees. So we'll send those out as part of our follow up email today. There's also a web page from the European Commission with information on rights, resources and policies, and we'll send this on too. And finally, from Aintis's position, including all of our members input, our current policy recommendations include a recommendation to provide all refugees in Ireland with the same education access and financial su support to ensure an anti-racist and fair approach in adult learning. So I just wanted to clarify that that's our position. Um, and I'll pass it over to Barry. It was very uh, short and brief input, so I don't want to take any time from Charlotte. Thanks, guys, and it's great to see you. Before we go any further, I just want to say a big uh, welcome. Uh, to Charlotte Bourne, the Education Officer for the Irish Refugee Council. Not only is Charlotte the Education Officer, but she's also uh, part of the, the team there that won the End of Star Award this year for third level access and engagement, which is, yeah, you're right, Amy, whoop, whoop, uh, which is, uh, it's, it's such a big deal. And in fairness, the judges were really and truly blown away because uh, with the Star Awards, look, the, the, the competition this year, it was the biggest actually competition we've ever had. Um, and you know, for, for a, a group like the uh, Irish Refugee Council to come out on top of such a competitive uh, process just shows you the great work that they're doing. And it really is respected and, and cherished, actually, by, by everybody here in Ada, especially. But just a big, you know, well done, first of all, to Charlotte for all that, the work that they're, that they're doing. And also a big welcome today because parents Charlotte and myself have been back and forth now for about two, two or three weeks uh, just working on this. And... Uh, I can't say anything but positive because she is just an absolute brilliant so I want to say a big massive thank you to Charlotte for one being here today and being so good with myself and, and educating me all the way throughout as well. So Charlotte, we'll uh, hand it over to yourself. Thanks a million, Barry. I have to say uh, you're a joy to deal with, so it was no hard work. <laughs> um, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks very much for inviting uh, the IRC to be here today and um, so what I'm going to do is I, I was just chatting to the guys in Aintos there before you everyone else came into the meeting and I was just saying that it can be um, very frustrating when you're sitting in a presentation and somebody's talking endlessly about stuff that you don't want to know and you're sitting there with a million questions thinking why don't they talk about this or that or whatever so I'm just going to invite you as I'm talking now or as I'm presenting to put any questions you want into the chat box and if I can answer them as I go along I will and uh, if I fail to talk and read at the same time which is not a great thing to be doing um, when you're in the breakout rooms I'll then be able to look at the questions okay so please feel free to ask anything if I don't know the answer I'll, uh, I'll admit to that and go and find an answer from somebody else. So what I plan to do is, uh, you know, in the absence of knowing what you want to hear, I'm going to spend about five minutes talking a little bit about the protection process, you know, that the things that people go through, um, the, the process that they go through in order to get their status here, not in any great detail, but just enough for you to understand the differences when you're dealing with people. Um, and then I'm going to spend most of the time, another 10 or 15 minutes talking about education access and what, you know, people are eligible for and so on and so forth. I'll try to sprinkle that with, you know, 
and you know and this is what's relevant to the Ukrainian people as well so that I'm sort of covering everything in as much as I know and as much as I can um and uh yeah so that's that's what I plan to do and then as I say I'll try to answer questions as I go along so here we go I'm going to share the screen get ready Barry for something to go wrong <laughs> fully brave here Charlotte fully brave <laughs> okay I'm ready. Uh, okay share Right, so I'm just gonna, I have two different documents that I'm going to refer to. Can you see that one all right there, Barry? Yeah, cool, Thank you. great. Okay, so this is a whistle stop tour of what happens when, briefly, when somebody happen, arrives into Ireland, just to give you a little bit of a, an idea. So somebody leaves their country for fear of persecution and they come to Ireland and they ask, they apply for international protection. Now, there are three different kinds of protections here in the centre, refugee status, subsidiary protection and permission to remain. And so when the person arrives here and they're settled into a centre, uh, in a reasonably short amount of time, they have to complete a very long questionnaire. Um, and it's one questionnaire, but that one application form. Sorry, I didn't mean that. That one application form is actually three applications in one. So when the Department of Justice get their application form, they, they look at it and they decide if this person uh, ticks all the boxes to be given refugee status. And if not, they will look to see, are they eligible for subsidiary protection? And if not, they will look to see, are they uh, eligible for permission to remain? And, you know, my, I have to say from the outset, my background is not law. You know, this is not my area, but, you know, I understand it obviously from working in the IRC for the past seven years. The first two protections, refugee status and subsidiary protection, they're called protection status and it, it comes under EU law. Whereas the permission to remain is a discretionary permit, permission and that more or less comes under Irish law, so it's discretionary. The first two are very, very tight, you know, like the criteria are very tight. So um, refugee status is basically a person who is, um, they live in fear of persecution on one of the five grounds of race, religion, political opinion, nationality, or membership of a particular social group. And they leave their country because their home country are either unwilling or unable to protect them. And th those expressions are really quite important, unwilling or unable. And so it means that they can't relocate to another part of their country, that they'll be safe. It doesn't matter where they are in their country, they, they will be unsafe. And on those grounds, they can come to any country and seek um, refugee status or protection. Subsidiary protection, the definition of that is a little bit different. It's where a person is fear of facing serious harm. And so that could be, you know, death penalty or execution, torture, inhumane or degrading treatment, um, or serious individual threat to the person's life, you know, just through indiscriminate violence, really. And again, a situation where moving to a different part of your country is not going to make you safe. Whatever is threatening you will get to you anywhere in the country, in your country, basically. And then permission to remain. Um, so if the first two have been denied, the Department of Justice will consider your application under a discretionary measure, which is called permission to remain. And so this is more vague, you know, there's no clear legal basis for this. So the things they include are personal circumstances, family connections to Ireland, the length of time you've been in Ireland, the contribution you've made, employment and education, you know, so for these reasons, a person could be given permission to remain. However, there are serious delays uh, in the process. This was us, you know, outside the uh, convention centre when the government were sitting there uh, last summer, I think it was, and we were protesting about the amount of time it takes the Department of Justice to uh, process an application, um, you know, to go through those, those steps. At the time, this was like quarter one last year, it was taking 27 months. And uh, in the last couple of months, um, it has got even slower because understandably the department are trying to deal with uh, all the people coming in from Ukraine, but it does mean that all the other people from non, you know, non-Ukrainians, if you like, and um, their applications are slowing and slowing and slowing. So there's a big problem there because even when people come into Ireland now, they're not getting 
um, they should in a matter of days or weeks be given a card which uh, permits them you know to access lots of things including a weekly payment of 38 euro and at the moment it's taking months it's it's in chaos chaos is not i'm not being uh, i'm not being dramatic i think when i when i say it's chaotic um but so when somebody comes here to seek protection they have the right to work as you probably know they can work full-time part-time or self-employed um and uh, the work permit is valid for 12 months and uh, they can pretty much work anywhere except in the likes of, you know, on Garda Síochána, Defence Forces, stuff like that. And the work permit is also relevant to accessing education. Um, and I'll come to that a little bit in a little bit. So basically when somebody arrives, let's say somebody arrives in Ireland today, the 18th of May, well, then in five months from now, so what would that be, June, July, August, September, October, 18th of October, they could apply for a work permit. And that will take a few weeks to be processed. And then when they get it, it's valid from the six month anniversary of when they applied for protection in Ireland. And with that, they can go and work and, and they can access all sorts of education. So, <clears throat> This you're probably all well aware of, you know, direct provision and the, the poor standards that people are living in while they're in direct provision. Um, and if you haven't seen a couple of nights ago, there was actually um, a documentary called Growing Up in Direct Provision on RTE. Um, I only caught up with it last night on RTE Player, so it's still there on RTE Player. It's 45 minutes long. It's quite a nice little documentary. Um, what they did in some cases was they gave mobile phones to children living in uh, direct provision and they let them kind of run around and sort of video their life. And so it's, it's, it's quite a nice little, I think it's a really good insight into what some of the circumstances are that people are living uh, in direct provision. Anyway, in relation to education, the government said that they would, where possible, move people from one direct provision centre to another center um, to accommodate third level education, um, but they said where possible. And in reality, it's very difficult. I, you know, I've had some students who live in, I don't know, Galway and they get an offer in Warford and they can't move because all the DP centers are full to overflowing, they're just at capacity. So despite the fact that the white paper said that they would move students where possible, it isn't really possible. Um, and at the moment, the government are committed to ending direct provision by 2024. Um, it's hard not to be cynical about that when you work in this area and you just see the what feels like the insurmountable walls in front of us, you know. Um, but anyway, we remain positive. We keep working. Um, so another thing that will be relevant to you guys, I think, is just to be aware that um, refugees, people seeking asylum, are eligible for bank accounts and driving licenses. A few years ago, they couldn't, uh, it was very difficult. In fact, they couldn't get driving licenses and it was very difficult to get a bank account. Now it's fairly straightforward to get a bank account. Driving licenses are permitted, but it's still difficult. You know, the practical, the practicalities of it are proving a bit difficult, but it is permissible. Um, so this, slide I think might be quite useful to, to most of you. So on the right hand side here, I've divided it in two, okay. Right hand side here are people who are international protection applicants. So they're still, they're in that waiting period. You know, they've submitted their application. They're waiting for the Department of Justice to process their application. Um, so, you know, they're people without stamp four, you might often hear that expression or no status, you know, they have no status. Um, but they have what's called a TRC card. This is a temporary residence card, or we often just call it the blue card, you know. So when they come into Ireland and they apply for protection, they get this temporary residence card. And on it, it'll have details like, you know, their name, the ID number. Uh, I think it also includes the date that they applied for protection on it as well. Um, so when people don't have stamp for, they are eligible for these things. So they're eligible for a student support scheme, which is just a grant scheme for protection applicants, very similar to SUSE. And I'll come back to that in a little more detail uh, in a few minutes. And um, they're also eligible to apply to higher education sanctuary scholarships. They're also eligible for VTOS once they have their work permit that I mentioned a few minutes ago. And they are also eligible to do PLC courses 
in the same manner as an Irish person. Uh, up until a couple of years ago, they uh, we were, believe it or not, we were still charging people who get 38 euros a week, three and a half thousand euro to do a PLC course. So that's all gone now and uh, they are treated the same as an Irish citizen. So when the um, protection process uh, application is processed and they receive their stamp for, so over on this side of the page, they, as I said earlier, they will either get refugee status, subsidiary protection, or permission or leave to remain. And I would say to you, don't get too worried about which one it is, because in all instances, they now have their stamp for, and they will receive this uh, pink card, <laughs> pinkish, pink and blue card, and it's called an IRP card, which is an Irish residence permit. Um, it used to be called GNIP, GNIB about five years ago. People still call it GNIB. It's like the way people still say FITAC, you know, and it's gone, you know, 10 years ago. Um, so, so these two cards, just by seeing somebody's card, you know whether they have their permission or not, basically. And, and that will be important when we come to various um, criteria eligibility for education funding. Um, so the last thing to say, actually, if I go back there for a minute, what I would say here is, although a person is eligible for SUSE and the Sanctuary Scholarship, when, uh, when people come to us, first of all, and they're looking for funding and support for education, we, <clears throat> in the first instance, I try to establish if they're eligible for state support. And if they are, we support them and direct them in that, in that direction. If they're not, our second plan would be to see, well, where have they applied to go to, to, to college? Is, is it a university and does that university have scholarships? And if it is, well, then we will direct them in that direction. If it's a further education college, we might direct them towards VITOS. <clears throat> but if all of that fails, um, be, you know, because you can't, you couldn't have a sanctuary scholarship and a SUSE grant, for example, or at least, yeah, you shouldn't really. Um, if all that fails, their only other recourse for funding is to charity. Um, and, and when I say charity, it's I include us in that. So the IRC, I believe, are the only national, nationally operating charity that has an education fund that we open every year. Um, and that's what I was about to put up here. This is, uh, if you or your friends or anybody you know are wanting to raise funds for, to support education specifically, um, we have this uh, fundraiser on our website. So I'm just going to swap over now to um, this education booklet. So that was kind of a whistle stop tour of the process people go through and, and who's eligible for what and so on. Um, so I want to now really talk about uh, education access. So this is a booklet that um, I've been putting together for about the last five years or so. At this time of the year, I, I do update it probably every week because I keep finding, you know, people give me more information or, you know, things change or I make mistakes or, you know, I'm only human, as they say. So the guide is, um, the guide is written for uh, protection applicants, students and refugees. You know, it's not written from your, for your perspective or my perspective, if you know what I mean, but it is very useful for people who work in this area because it helps you to understand what refugees and protection applicants are eligible for. Um, now, I have emailed this to a lot of people. Or I don't email the PDF because it changes every week. I just email the link to our website. So it's on the website. Um, and I've already sent it to guidance counsellors in the ETBs. I think there's a few, few online here today, so you probably received this already. Um, I also have a, a mailing list for people who work in higher education. I have an email list, what I call uh, my outreach people. <laughs> so these are individuals or groups that work to support um, people seeking protection in Ireland. And I also have another email list, which I call my further education uh, email list. And on that, I have um, people who work in colleges of further education. So the, the link to this has been sent out to my guidance list, the outreach list and the higher education list. I haven't sent it out to the further education list yet because I'm updating that list. Uh, I only use those email lists, I'd say twice, maximum three times a year. If any of you are not on it and you want to be, just let me know. Um, I promise it's, it'll be one, two, maximum three emails a year. It's only when there's something fairly, um, something fairly large, you know. 
Um, so yeah, so the booklet is written from the point of view, I'm, I'm going to literally go through it, but I'm not going to talk about every page. <clears throat> it's written from the point of view of the students. Um, we have a Facebook page, but it is only for um, students, you know, people seeking asylum students, not for you. <clears throat> if you try to get into it, you won't be let in. Um, it's just a safe space that we can share information with them. <clears throat> um, and then on this side, we have a few little links to primary and secondary education because some of the students that come to us have children and they might need to be directed that way. But essentially, this book is about further and higher education. Um, one of the biggest things that I think, one of the most important things that I feel I ever do for a person is to put them in front of a guidance counsellor. Um, so that's why we feature it pretty much at the beginning of the book. So we say to people, go and see a guidance counsellor and tell them about your past, present and future and they will put you on the right track because it's often a case that a person will be living in a direct provision centre and somebody uh, in the centre will, will say to them, oh, you can do this course in this college uh, and you'll have no trouble. And then everybody's doing that course. And like the number of times I get, I meet somebody where they've spent a year doing a course in, I don't know, let's say healthcare or something. And then they come to me and they say, I've just done this course in healthcare, but actually at home I was an accountant and I don't really want to work in healthcare. I just did it because everyone else was. Um, whereas I feel if that person had spoken to a guidance counselor at the beginning, they wouldn't have not wasted the year, but you know, you can't, as you know, you have to keep going up the NFQ. You can't keep doing level fives all the time. Um, so in the booklet, if somebody clicks on this map, it takes them to that website. Um, where they can zoom in and find obviously the name and address and phone numbers and details of their local guidance counsellor. Um, it also gives them some information on NFQ. Um, we uh, then direct them to NARC in case they want to have their previous um, education qualifications recognised. Um, we point them in the direction of further education, so all these links will take them to, you know, fetch courses where they can go and find a link. Um, I, I have to apologise about these two pages. I know they look awful, but I really wanted to put them in there. They were provided by the department and um, because English language is so key that when I got this information, I thought I really need people to have this. Even if it is tiny, they can at least zoom in on their own county and find somebody um yeah so it's it's not a pretty page but it's really useful um so the next section deals with how a person might get funding um so i start off with state funding and you can see them all there back to education initiative back btea vitos and so on um i just want to draw your attention to a couple of things with regard to back to education allowance um and because this change only happened only happened a year or so ago and people are still tripping up over it. The general criteria for back to education allowance would be that you normally have to secure a place on a course before you start the course and you would normally need to be on social welfare payment for nine months or three months before you would apply for back to education allowance but there are exceptions to this criteria for refugees and protection applicants. And they're really important because what it means is you can apply for back to education allowance after the course has started. And the nine or three months um, can be a combination of job seekers allowance and the daily expense allowance. Now, the daily expense allowance is the 38 euros that people receive every week. They get it every week. I don't know why it's called the daily expense allowance, but anyway, there you have it. And technically speaking, it's not a social welfare payment. So, um, so that's why it often gets left out. You know, it's never considered an eligible social welfare payment. But anyway, after much, much, much arguing uh, with the department, we finally got them to agree to this and um, to allow that to be included. Because what was happening in effect was that you had, I'll give you an example, a protection applicant starts a course in September. In October and November, they get their refugee status. They, they are then eligible to apply for job seekers allowance, but they can't because they're in full-time education. And then they can't apply for back to education allowance because they didn't apply for it before they started the course, but they didn't know when they started the course that they were about to get their refugee status. So a lot of people at that time were in this awful situation where in order to get money, they had to drop out of the course um, or else they had to try and stay on in the course with no money. 
Um, and it was just a crazy, crazy situation. So this last section down here is, um, it's a quotation from the Back to Education Allowance Operational Guidelines. And if you, when you're looking at it, if you click on that link up there, it'll take you to that document because it's always quite hard to find, I think. Um, and then if you go down to section three, you'll see this here where it says protection applicants who are studying full time who then receive stamp four after the commencement of the academic year are entitled to apply to back to education allowance. It extends to back to edu it extends applications to protection applicants who have commenced studying prior to receiving their permission from the date that they received the permission. So, yeah, just so that you know that that's possible. It's really it's really that's a really important point that it's very difficult to communicate because it's just a little bit complicated. Um, and then my next, uh, VTOS is my absolute bugbear. It's great in one way, but in another way, it's terrible. And it's great because obviously it means that somebody doesn't have to pay any fees. And once a protection applicant has a work permit, they are eligible to apply to VTOS. But the problem is that to apply to VTOS, there's a form, I think it's called the F103A or something like that. And they get that from the college or the VTOS coordinator. They have to take it down to the intro office. Um, but there is no, on that form, there is no box to tick to say that you receive the daily expense allowance. So all the boxes are things like job seekers allowance, um, supplementary welfare allowance, uh, sole parent, you know, all the other social welfare payments. And because, as I mentioned, the daily expense allowance is not technically, technically considered um, a social welfare payment, it's not on that list. So it's often a case where somebody is in the intro office and the intro officer is saying, no, you're not eligible for that, your payment isn't listed here, but they are eligible for it. And, and it's the number of times that I have tried desperately to get somebody onto VTOS and I have just failed because you cannot speak to somebody um, to make that work. So, um, so if they get it, it's great. Um, and I suppose uh, over here, I have a little note for um, the PLC centres and the VTOS coordinators, either a student who has a temporary residence card, so they're a protection applicant and they have a work permit, that means they're eligible for VTOS, or a person has a stamp for the refugee status and they're eligible for VTOS. So there are very few circumstances where a person in the protection system would not be eligible for VTOS, basically, that's what that boils down to. So that's that. Um, other funding include uh, for, you know, for undergraduate degrees and uh, further education as well. Our, Susie, you're probably well familiar with, and the Student Support Scheme for People in the International Protection System. It's a trips off the tongue, that title, doesn't it? Um, <laughs> but anyway, basically they're identical, except this is for people with stamp four and this is for people without stamp four. And the only one other little subtle difference is that to apply for SUSE, you have to have been in the state for three out of five years um, from the start date of your course. So if your course starts on the 10th of September, you have to have been here 9th of September, three years prior to that, you know, physically present in the state. Whereas with the student support scheme, you also need three years here, but you need three years in the protection system. So even if you've been in Ireland for 10 years, the three years is counted from the date that you applied for protection. Because sometimes people will be in the country for quite a long time before they figure out how to even apply for protection. So with this one, you have to have applied for protection and it's before the 31st of August. So it doesn't matter what date the course starts. It's um, it's the 31st of August is the key date there. Um, so it goes on then to give people information like, for example, you know, these are the list of universities you can apply for that are eligible for SUSE. And very importantly, this is a list of colleges that you might get an offer from the CAO for, for but they're not eligible for state grant because they're private, you know, and all too frequently, I'll get an email from somebody very excited because they've got an offer, you know, from Griffith College or Dublin Business School or one of those. And it's heartbreaking to have to tell them that's great, but you're not eligible for any funding. You know, the state won't support that. Um, 1916 bursary, a little bit there. There's a page telling them how to apply to PLC courses. You all know that good stuff. Um, how they can apply to CAO. 
uh, also explaining the sort of most popular pathways for people in the protection system. So either leaving certificate, PLC course, access program or a mature student, they would be the most popular. Um, another horrible page there, sorry, of tiny little print. But there is a li there is a link that would take you to the live, um, the live update of that. That's just a screenshot from the back of the CAO booklet. But it's just to give people a little bit of an idea. And you know, there are phone numbers and contact details there if they want to go down that route. Um, we explain the international fee system, you know, international fees, EU fee, free fee scheme, and all that kind of thing. Actually, while I'm here, I'll tell you that it's one of the things, it's my it's top of my list at the moment. Top of my list is to convince the government to stop charging everybody international fees. Um, and the fact that they have agreed to do that for Ukrainian students is brilliant because if they can do it for Ukrainian students, they can do it for anyone fleeing conflict anywhere else. So, you know, that's great. Um, Charlotte, I was just going to come in there. Do you find that there's, there's, there's sometimes that there is that division between the Ukrainian refugee situation and just the refugees in, in general yeah i mean i think it's it's unprecedented you know it's unprecedented in our in in our in ever in the history of the state that we have had this number of people arriving at one time you know and the, the volumes are, are enormous at the moment there are about eleven thousand people in ireland in you know direct provision so let's say people seeking protection from non-ukrainian background about eleven thousand, and yet in the last and that's you know going on for years and in the last two months, we've had nearly, I think it's 30,000 now Ukrainians. So there are three times more people from Ukraine here than there are from all those other countries. And I think that strengthens the argument of if you can do it for this group, you can do it for this group, you know. Um, <clears throat> I, I, I don't know. Obviously, I don't know why the government have done that or I, I don't know their thinking of it, but we've we've just actually created a policy paper that we are going to send today or tomorrow um, and hope you know privately and then hopefully next week we'll make that public and and this is one of the this is the top thing on my agenda is you know those fees it's it's just it's not right is all i would say pretty much every university institute of technology and Techno technological university in ireland now offer uh, scholarships now they might only have one or two, some of them have 10 or 15, but at least they're there and altogether they add up to quite a lot. So if you're interested in looking at any one of them for somebody that you're working with, the first page deals with access programs. Um, you'll see a couple of those lines are blank. It's because I haven't got the information yet from Trinity or NUI Galway. Um, and then we go on to the undergraduate and I've divided undergraduate by county. Um, so in alphabetical order. Um, so Carlo Cork, Donegal, Dublin, Galway, Kerry, Kildare, Limerick, Loud, Mayo, Sligo, Waterford, Wexford and Westmead. So they're all undergraduate scholarships. And, and on those pages, it tells you how many scholarships are available. And um, they're all fee waivers, but some of them also include a maintenance element. You see that there. Um, and then some provide other things like, you know, a laptop or a mentor or whatever. And where possible, then I put a clink, uh, a link into um, either a website on their page or an email to somebody that you can get more information from. And if there's a closing date, we do that as well. And then <clears throat> there's one page for postgraduates. And a few years ago, there were no postgraduate scholarships. So, you know, there's about seven or eight there, I think now. And um, so that's really useful. This is a page I'm building. So there's not an awful lot on that at the moment. And then we end with a list of charities. If you, you know, if somebody's not available, eligible for state support, sanctuary scholarship, well then, you know, you're looking at charities. We're there, obviously, I mentioned the fund that we have. If you click on any of those logos, it'll give you more information. Um, Leap card, about a hundred times every September, I have to explain to somebody how to get a Leap card. Um, so I decided I'd put it in the booklet this year. Um, and then Sarah <coughs> Sarah is <coughs> a new online, platform with education. It's, um, uh, it's collaborative between DERS, New Horizons and Dignity Partnerships. So that's well worth checking out as well. And then the last couple of pages are just useful websites. So there we go. A whistle stop tour, Barry. 
Uh, thank you so much, Charlotte. Um, listen, really do appreciate that. I suppose you, you sort of alluded to the dimensions of the crisis that we're actually facing at the minute um, regarding the number of refugees and, you know, the things that, that are needed for them. And, and, you know, look, civil society itself, is, is, you know, will be able to create and is creating, um, you know, support uh, as best we can. But again, mm-hmm. webinars like this here do help us all, I, I find, um, because again, we can share, we can share our, our responses and our experiences as well. Um, the book that there that you've just, um, or that you have designed, I have to say, that would have come in very handy when I was teaching in an LTA, just in general, uh, because of the different resources there. And I, I have seen it before, <laughs> uh, and, and it is quite interactive as well. So there's plenty of links there, and there's plenty of, of things that you know yeah. you can you can pull out depending on the learner that you're that you're working with. Uh, at the time. So, look, we'll quickly go into uh, breakout rooms. Uh, I'm going to ask uh, Amy if we can share the questions in the chat box. We have a few few quick little questions for you. Uh, we've roughly about 10, 15 minutes. Then what we'll do is we'll bring, uh, bring everyone back. It's just an opportunity for you to bring your experience and to hear from other, um, from other groups and members as well. <laughs> Sorry, my video is still loading, but I'm here. Um, we we kind of covered um, a range of topics when we were in our breakout room um, from individuals who are coming in to Ireland who have different qualifications or have high level qualifications that may not be recognised here. Um, people who have left their who have left education early and are unsure about what to do next. And then also we briefly touched on um, the importance of providing emotional support and um, allowing um, refugees or individuals who are seeking protection to have that space to kind of work through their trauma in a safe environment. So that's just a um, brief summary of the topics it covered. Really important topic for that as well. So thank you very much, uh, Juliana. Uh, We'll give a bit of feedback maybe from Charlotte uh, after this. Um, Derval, in room two. Yeah, um, we had a great discussion. So the main things that people were looking for is that ESOL classes coming in for English language support, but there's a big challenge that a lot of those classes will finish in mainstream education during the summer. So GRETB are being um, really good going above and beyond and they're making a list of tutors uh, that are available to work during the summer because the cap of 850 hours um, has been lifted for the moment. So they're trying to provide classes continuously during the summer, except perhaps during August, just to make sure the tutors get a break as well. And there's also people looking for advice to go to college. The community ed groups have come in and done some artwork, which is great because it's supporting the learners and it's been very uplifting. And then um, one of the issues identified by GRETB was that they're not being told when learners come into the area or people come into the area. So, for example, there is one group placed in a and b but they'd sat there for two or three weeks without any engagement because the person who ran the B&B didn't even know that an ETB existed in the area. So it's just kind of that misinf- or miscommunication along the way. Um, So we need to build better infrastructure to make sure that there's improved communication. Um, And then in Tipperary, they were saying that some people are coming into the area, but they might leave then again in two to three weeks. So because people are continuously being moved around, that's a big challenge as well. Excellent points, Daryl. Thank you so much for that. Um, And in room three, we had Joan. Thank you, Barry. We had the pleasure pleasure of Charlotte and others in our room. And we had a very informal discussion, but very important discussion nonetheless. And we picked up on the um, program that Charlotte mentioned earlier that was um, recorded Monday night on, on the, the, the centres. And I suppose we just made the point that it's a pity it took um, the war in Ukraine for real change to emerge in the Irish context. Um, and obviously we have high regard for the Ukrainian refugees, but we have to bear in mind refugees from other countries as well and their status and things. And that's a really, really important point um, that came out of it. And that, that was the summation of our, uh, our, our discussion. So thanks very much um, to all of you for your contribution. Yeah, ac- excellent, excellent point there, uh, Joan. Um, uh, our point there, Joan, in the room. Uh, and in room four, we have uh, Connor. 
Thanks, Barry. Um, in our room, we had a very interesting discussion about some practicalities. For instance, in Tipperary TV, they've managed to get the learner details form translated into Ukrainian and Russian, which seemed to be a big step in uh, reducing that barrier to people actually accessing the uh, language services there, and then other barriers like PPS and things like that. Um, but it was mentioned that events like today really help with that type of thing and are actually empowering as they give really valuable information around that bureaucracy for people that are working on the ground with learners who are entering the system for the first time. Um, both, um, both practitioners in our group mentioned how they're really dependent on volunteers from within the Ukrainian community or people who speak Ukrainian or Russian to volunteer um, and to work with the people who would be beginners in terms of English language learning to help them like translate forms and stuff like that as well. So it was mentioned that depending much more on the community really than any kind of formal supports from the top down as well. And uh, that was everything from our group. I thought of was that I didn't probably didn't explain very much about what people from Ukraine are eligible for in relation to you know the other two groups I was talking about but I suppose essentially um you know when they get here they get a PTS number they're eligible for social welfare you know they can work immediately so they're in a much better place you know because they get all those things fairly quickly because it's a temporary protection it's kind of somewhere between the other two is the best way to think about it. So it's it's not a permanent thing, but they get access to a lot immediately. Um, and there's a lot happening in the education space at the moment. So um, I think we'll be issuing some press releases and some education policy documents next week.